Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to quickly to say, uh, say uh, a Bowen. So um, Bowen joined us in the computer science department in the next step. And uh, it was really great. And uh, I'm uh, to, uh, to work with him and uh, he brought a lot of knowledge of history into our group and uh, uh, taught us a lot, uh, led to interesting You're breaking up. Yeah, I, 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 I had trouble hearing that as well. Okay. Perhaps Vijay, you go. I, I, I connection is. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, is it Zoom working? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sounds okay. good. Um, so it's it's a great pleasure and a little sadness for me uh, with Bowen's uh, graduation here, uh, his thesis defense, because Bowen is the last student that will graduate from my lab in Stanford Chemistry. Uh, and I think it's really fitting because in many ways, when I think about what Bowen has done, I think he's the future of what chemistry grad students could look like. Uh, many of you might not know this, that he came in through the department through the organic chemistry track. So not the theoretical chemistry track or the physical chemistry track or the biophysics, biophysical, straight through the organic chemistry track. And um, what excited me about having him join my lab was what he was able to bring especially to bring all the intuition from what he's learned in organic chemistry. Um, actually, it's funny that Rogers uh, was very right that, you know, I was trained as a physicist. And as a physicist, you know, I could solve the Schrodinger equation, but it's only as a chemist did I really develop the chemical intuition that I think has really served me well and served the group well over the last two decades. And, and it was very important, I think, for Bowen to bring that to the lab. What we were doing in the lab at that time was, uh, as we were always trying to do, try to think about the future of chemistry and machine learning was very much on our minds and Bowen jumped right in um, with, uh, with many collaborations with actually uh, with uh, people in this room here with Paul, with Carla, uh, with Yuri. And I think when I think about Bowen's strengths, first off, his ability to learn is just so impressive. For him to come through the organic chemistry track and become a machine learning connoisseur, expert, pioneer is I think very unusual and, and, and really spectacular. He's also obviously very collaborative, having papers with uh, people, uh, pe everyone on this committee here, uh, representing now not just the breadth, but his ability to collaborate and ability to get things done. And, and then uh, finally, um, this is something that you only see if you work with him. Um, he's extremely creative and it was a lot of fun for me, especially near the end of his PhD, when he has all the skills down and he could do anything. Now the question is, what do you do? And those were some of the most fun conversations for me. Um, and so it's interesting to think about like along the lines of what we were talking about, like, so uh, to try to figure out what the label is for Bowen. Is Bowen a theoretical chemist, a machine learning chemist? Um, all these things to sort of naturally fit together in many ways because machine learning is really inherently empirical. Chemistry is inherently empirical. These two just go together so beautifully. So what I would argue is that um, he's not a theoretical chemist or organic chemist or a physical chemist. Um, Bowen's a chemist. And he's the future of chemistry as I see it. And so uh, hopefully what you'll see today in his uh, thesis defense is maybe the early parts of this next chapter of chemistry. Great, thank you. Uh, should, I, should I start? I'm gonna share my screen. You heard resounding applause <laughs> <laughs> after that. <laughs> This filling in the gaps. Yeah, it is odd doing this stuff over Zoom. It is also, it's my last defense and my first on Zoom. <laughs> um, okay, can, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank, thank you so much, uh, VJ and Yuri, for your uh, kind words. Um, you know, the past, or during my time at Stanford, I've, I've greatly enjoyed uh, working with both of you. Um, so yeah, th thanks everyone for attending uh, this uh, thesis talk. Um, I'm very excited to talk a, a bit about our work on a machine learning for small molecule uh, lead optimization. So, so the motivation for this work is that um, you know, developing new drugs is, is pretty hard. Uh, there's been various studies um, about how hard uh, this process is. 
with estimates, for example, of the success rate through uh, clinical trials overall to be around 10%. And uh, some estimates um, have shown that maybe the cost of developing a new drug could be around one to three uh, US billion dollars. And, and this cost has not really significantly decreased over the past uh, decade. Um, this diagram here shows a typical uh, drug discovery um, process, starting from you know, target discovery, a lot of fundamental biology to find uh, potential drug targets uh, to, to modulate uh, for your disease all the way to searching for molecules and developing molecules further into drug candidates and doing uh, various uh, cell experiments, animal experiments, and then later on human experiments. Um, so in this talk, I'll focus on uh, some of the work that we've done uh, in the lead optimization phase, which is a phase where there is a lot of uh, medicinal chemistry, organic chemistry, um, and where computation could potentially be very useful. Um, so, so the lead optimization, lead optimization phase and for small molecule drug discovery is where you have a lead molecule and then you want to develop it further and make changes to it until you have a potential drug candidate. And, you know, people have kind of uh, analyzed this kind of uh, process and you can kind of see it as a iterative process of a series of design, make and test phases. And you can further break down these phases into a series of sub -problems. Problems. Uh, for example, uh, you know, after getting some experimental data from your molecules, you want to be able to predict the, uh, the, the properties of new molecules. Uh, you want to generate new ideas for molecules. Uh, you want to actually try and predict how to make the molecule, make it in the lab, run some more experimental tests, and so on. And our thesis here is that machine learning can potentially be used to speed up and improve uh, certain parts of this uh, lead optimization process. So in this talk, I will focus uh, mainly on the early design phases uh, in, in the problem of molecular property prediction, uh, molecule generation, and uh, uh, some work on uh, synthesis, synthesis planning. So the first uh, piece of work that I want to talk about is actually our most recent work that we presented in the iClear conference earlier this year um, in the problem of uh, molecular property prediction. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Wei Hua, who's a PhD student in the, uh, in the computer science department, as well as Joe, who's now a professor at the University of Iowa, Marinka, who's now a professor at Harvard, and Stanford professors Percy, Vijay, and Yuri. So the molecular property prediction problem in one form can be specified very simply. Um, given a molecule structure, can you predict one of its properties? Uh, for example, whether it's toxic or not, and whether it binds a particular enzyme or not. And the motivation here is that actually experimentally testing molecules in the lab um, can be very costly, both in terms of time and money. And so ideally, you'll be, you'll be able to you know, build some computational models to be able to make accurate predictions and so that you can you know, almost run some virtual experiments and reduce the number of actual experiments you have to run. Um, a particular deep learning architecture um, has recently been shown to be very good for making predictions on graph structured data. And uh, as a brief introduction of how you can actually make predictions on, uh, on graph level properties, such as molecular properties, um, here's a brief diagram. So uh, a particular flavor of graph neural networks is a mes uh, follows a message passing paradigm. where given an input graph, in this case a molecule graph, you can, uh, where the nodes represent atoms and the edges represent the bonds, you can uh, initialize the node embeddings uh, with some basic um, atom information, such as atom type, um, some you know, atom stereochemistry. Um, and then through a series of uh, message passing steps, um, each node embedding is updated from the information of its directly connected neighbors. And eventually after a few steps of message passing, you obtain these updated node embeddings that summarize the local neighborhood around uh, each node. Then you, you pull together these node embeddings, uh, for example, taking the average of the sum to obtain a single embedding that represents, uh, kind of summarizes your input graph. And then that can be directly used for your uh, downstream prediction tasks, such as predicting uh, toxicity of this input molecule. Um, you know, naturally there are some challenges in, in, in molecular property prediction. Um, firstly, uh, there just isn't a lot of label data uh, that's out there that's usually for the particular problem you're interested in. 
because uh, I mentioned previously, you know, these labels require ex uh, experiments, which are relatively expensive. And as a consequence of this, um, a lot of these machine learning models tend to overfit to these very small um, training data sets. The second challenge is more in how, you, how we want to use these models. Um, we want to use these models for scientific discovery, right, where almost by definition, the things that you want to make predictions on are going to be quite different from the things that you saw, yeah, that you've seen uh, previously. Uh, so for example, you may want to predict the properties of molecules that you've just synthesized um, that are you know, kind of structurally different to the ones that you've seen previously. And empirically, we, you know, we've seen that machine learning models usually extrapolate uh, not so well. Um, and in a lot of these prospective settings, when you're deploying these machine learning models um, you know, in, in a uh, drug discovery uh, process, uh, the performance kind of decreases significantly. So you know, it seems that uh, transfer learning um, could be a potential solution. So transfer learning are, are methods that kind of can leverage um, other kinds of data to make such that you can make better predictions for your own particular problem where you don't have a lot of data. Um, at least in the molecule prediction space, you know, we have a, quite a, like a very large amount of unlabeled data in that we know a lot of molecules that have been made. And we also have relatively large amounts of label data, but usually for other kinds of tasks, um, auxiliary, you know, bioassays. Um, for example, you know, we have a Kimball database that contains, uh, you know, the measured bio act bioactivities of, of a lot of different molecules. And we know in, in other fields like um, computer vision and natural language processing that transfer learning methods have been used uh, uh, to great effect. However, if, if you uh, just naively apply a lot of transfer learning methods to, to, to these scientific problems, for example, predict, predicting molecular, molecular properties, um, you'll see that actually in a lot of cases, you can actually hurt your performance in, in your actual downstream uh, task that you're interested in. Um, this is called negative transfer. And you know, some of it, part of it is kind of related to how, how related your auxiliary data is to your actual downstream data. And you know, this requires kind of a lot of domain expertise to pick out the specific uh, auxiliary data you want to use. Uh, and so overall, these processes when applied to the scientific domain um, is not very uh, robust. So, so we, our key insight for how to you know, perform transfer learning and for example, pre-training uh, for graph neural networks is we should pr uh, perform pre-training both at the level of, of the nodes as well as at the level of the graphs. So here, when I refer to node level and graph level, um, I refer to you know, where we provide the training signal. So node level pre-training methods are ones where you use the updated node embeddings for your prediction task. Whereas for the graph level pre-training methods, we use the final graph embedding that summarizes your input graph uh, to predict various uh, graph level properties, such as um, you know, molecular uh, enzyme binding, um, whether it's toxic. And um, you know, this cartoon kind of tries to show why we think uh, our proposed strategy of both node level and graph level pre-training um, uh, is more robust. So here I'm illustrating the node, uh, the node embeddings as well as the graph embeddings. And here you can kind of see various uh, node embeddings are pulled together to form uh, different graph embeddings. And here you, you can just think of graph embeddings as molecules and uh, node embeddings as uh, perhaps local environments uh, centered around an atom. And so um, uh, things of the same color should be you know, more chemically similar. And so if you were to look at the middle column uh, where you just naively apply graph level pre-training, for example, you pre-train on auxiliary molecular properties from Kimball, then you know, obviously your graph embeddings are well embedded, right? Because you're directly training for it. But there's no guarantee that, you're, that, 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 that the building blocks, that your node embeddings are, are meaningful. For example, you know, chemically different environments might actually be embedded close together. Um, so after pre-training like this, uh, just doing graphical pre-training, if you were to apply to downstream data set, that's very different to what you pre-train on, then perhaps negative transfer could occur because you haven't learned the good uh, building blocks. Uh, on the left, you know, if you just naively, naively apply no-level pre-training, then naturally your node embeddings are well embedded, but you know, the model doesn't really know how to pull together different node embeddings to form good graph embeddings. And so what we're saying is, um, if you do both node level and graph level pre-training, then you know, all your embeddings are well embedded, and then you can have a robust transfer to various downstream data sets. So we propose a few different pre-training methods. Um, uh, you know, we have node level and graph level pre-training. 
We also have another differentia uh, differentiation. Um, one is we call structure prediction based methods where we only need to know the um, graph connectivity information. So like what node is connected to what other node. Whereas the attribute prediction type methods are ones where you, where you need the um, graph connectivity information as well as some uh, domain specific information. For example, uh, an attribute masking, you need maybe, uh, you know, atom information. And for, you know, supervised attribute, attribute prediction in the graph level, you also maybe need uh, molecular properties um, from other bioassays. So in the next few slides, I'll briefly go over our two node level pre-training methods, as well as um, the particular graph level pre-training method that we use. So the first uh, node level pre-training method is attribute masking. And this is conceptually very simple. So we're basically um, uh, masking out certain uh, nodes, so certain atoms. We're running uh, message passing uh, with our graph neural network to get updated node embeddings. And then we're asking the model to predict what the missing kind of uh, atom information uh, is. Um, and the idea here is that in order for the model to predict this, uh, to do this task well, then it should be able to generate node embeddings that can capture some aspect of uh, the domain specific information. So in this case, it could be um, you know, learning some aspect of chemical valency or um, you know, learning something about some basic information about functional groups. The second node level uh, pre-training method that we came up with is called context prediction, where we apply the uh, distribution hypothesis to the graph space. Um, so the distribution hypothesis uh, in natural language processing is um, the assumption that, that words that occur in a similar context, you know, that are surrounded by a similar context, should have similar meaning. And here we're saying subgraphs that are surrounded by a similar context graph should be uh, more similar. And in that case, it would be maybe more chemically similar. So here we uh, define our subgraph as this, uh, in this cartoon, uh, the subgraph that's um, enclosed by this blue circle and the context as the graph that's kind of in this uh, donut, purple donut between R1 and R2, that's around the subgraph. And the prediction task here is given a pair of subgraph and context, uh, is it a true pair or not? Um, as in, does it come from the same molecule or was it something that were randomly generated? And the idea here is that in order for the model to you know, predict this task well, then it should learn to create node embeddings that can capture um, local graph structure. And then thirdly, for our graph level pre-training, we use um, you know, a very simple multitask prediction of um, different uh, auxiliary labels. So here we're using our graph embedding to summarize our input graph to simultaneously predict various biological properties um, derived from the Campbell database. So our overall you know, pre-training strategy, our approach is you know, we, we use a particular flavor of a graph neural network called the uh, graph isomorphism network, uh, which is recently shown to be very expressive. And our training procedure is we first perform no level pre-training on unlabeled data. Then we perform graph level pre-training on our labeled um, but auxiliary data from Kimball. And then after getting our pre-trained model, we then fine tune it on our downstream data sets and the actual problems that we're interested in. So some more details on the, on the actual setup for this uh, problem. So uh, the task is given a molecule, um, and we're doing binary classification here. So given a molecule, predict a yes or a no for a particular property. Um, we represent our molecules um, very simply. So nodes, we just have the atom type and the atom stereochemistry information. And for the uh, edges, we have the bond type and the bond stereochemistry. And so for the pre-training data, for the unlabeled data, we, use, we sample about 2 million molecules from the zinc database, which is a database of molecules that you can actually buy. So we know that these molecules are real and have been made before. And for the label data set, we use a pre-filtered Campbell database containing about 400,000 molecules. Um, and there's about 1,300 different biological assays um, and measurements. And for the downstream data set, so these are data sets that uh, were the tasks that we're actually interested in. We use eight different molecular data sets from the molecule net benchmark, which is a uh, gold standard benchmark in this kind of molecular property prediction problem. And also, you know, we also want to see how well our model generalizes. And so we, we split our, our, our data set into train and test splits such that the, the test, the molecules that we have in the test uh, split are very structurally different from the molecules that we have uh, when we train the model. So here's a little snapshot of some of our results. Um, so here I'm, compare, I'm looking at the average ROC-AUC improvement over no pre-training. 
and rock AUC is, is a measurement for, for, for how good the binary classification performance is. Um, and so, you know, here we have uh, just naive graph level pre-training and, and, uh, and a naive uh, no level uh, prediction by itself. And we see both of them kind of increase the performance on average. Um, but, you know, once we include both the no level and the graph level supervised pre-training, then we have the highest uh, performance improvement. I think what's a bit more interesting is that if you were to look at the results in a bit more detail, so this is, we're looking at the individual ROC AUC improvement um, for each of the eight downstream data sets. And you can see that if you just naively apply graph level supervised pre-training, you know, which is what people typically do when they, you know, pre-train a model on existing molecular, uh, molecular property data, then you can see that there's, there's, there's two kind of data sets where we don't have, you know, a significant improvement. And actually we have a, a decrease in performance, which we labeled here as negative transfer. Um, but if you include both a no level uh, pre-training method and a graph level pre-training method, so in this case, a no level one, we use context prediction. So if you combine both of them, then for all of these data sets, we have quite significant improvements. So in conclusion, this work, um, I would say was probably one of the first um, systematic studies of, of how to pre-train graph neural networks. And yeah, we also provided evidence for, uh, that showed you know, just naively applying pre-training um, can actually lead to a decrease in performance. Um, but overall, we showed that the strategy that we proposed of combining a no level and a graph level pre-training method um, reduces negative transfer and overall improves, improves the generalization performance. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, we're very excited about that. So, so the second piece of work that I wanna talk about is our work on uh, molecule generation. And, and this was work done uh, that was presented in the Europe's conference in 2018. And it was done in collaboration with uh, Joshuan and Rex, who are uh, both PhD students in the computer science department and uh, professors VJ and URA. So, you know, one, uh, you know, the molecule generation problem can also be stated uh, quite simply. Um, the idea is how, how do you generate uh, molecules with, with desired properties uh, where the molecules are, are both valid and realistic? And the motivation here is that you know, chemical space is very, very large. There's been various estimates and, you know, trying to, trying to estimate, um, estimate how many potential drug-like molecules are possible, right? And it's, you know, something in the range of 10 to the 23 to 10 to the 60. Um, but, you know, throughout history, humans have probably only made about 10 to the 8 molecules. You know, so, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of chemical spaces unexplored. And chances are, you know, future medicines and future, you know, materials are probably going to be mole uh, like molecules that we currently don't have. And so it's, it's probably not good enough to just screen our existing libraries of molecules. Um, you should also be able to generate new ideas for molecules. Um, you know, there are also challenges in, in this molecule generation problem. Um, and and I'll, I'll mainly focus on, on the, the more recent deep learning methods for generating molecules. And, and so the first kind of approach is a text generation based approach where, you know, it turns out you can actually represent molecules um, as text sequences. Um, in this case, uh, for example, a smiles sequence. Um, and then you can apply like a lot of uh, deep learning models for language generation to kind of generate uh, text sequences that represent molecules. Um, I guess one of the big challenges here is that actually a text representation of a molecule is, is actually pretty fragile. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, provide some concrete examples. And because of this, and you know, these methods, you know, one challenge is that it's, it's actually pretty hard to generate molecules that are valid, you know, that respect, you know, chemical rules. The second kind of approach is a graph generation approach where you, uh, where you, where the deep learning model directly outputs your, your graph structure. And at the time when we did this work was uh, early 2018. Um, you know, there wasn't really a lot of, of work in this area. There might have been, there was like a few preliminary work and one uh, other work from, from Euro's group on generating um, graph structures because it is a challenging uh, task, right? You know, generate graph structures are very complex, uh, relatively complex objects with a lot of possible, you know, outputs, uh, a lot of possible outputs. And you also have the problem of graph isomorphism where, you know, um, the same graph can be represented by different um, representations because you can actually permute the ordering of the nodes, but still have the same graph. And there's all these uh, complex dependencies between your nodes and edges. 
and so uh, you know um so graph generation uh, you know is challenging but specifically what why text representation is not so good um you know it, it turns out if you even change a single character in, in some of these text sequences you can completely invalidate your molecule structure and also you know small changes in your text sequence um, can actually result in relatively big changes in your molecular, uh, molecular structure which makes property optimization a bit uh, hard and so given that you know when we're designing uh, when we're doing this work at the start with we wanted to create a model that could generate graphs that fulfilled um, these kind of three criteria the first one is we want to generate graphs or molecule graphs that could optimize for a particular property. Um, uh, for example, maybe optimizing a binding affinity that we can obtain from a property predictor that I mentioned in the previous work. This, the second one is, you know, these graphs that we want to generate, for example, molecular graphs are not just abstract graph objects, but they are, you know, real life objects. And, and there's certain laws of physics and, and, and laws of chemistry that these graphs have to obey. Uh, for example, you know, chem chemical valency rules. Um, so we wanted a model to generate graphs that could, that could be valid. And thirdly, not only do we want these graphs to be valid, but we also want them to be realistic. Um, and the idea here is, you know, it's probably easy to, to, to say, to, to determine whether something's realistic or not, but it's probably very hard to encode specifically what makes something realistic. And so the idea here was, you know, we could instead provide a set of examples that we have deemed to be realistic and then just ask the model to, to, to you know, generate new examples that are similar to the set of realistic uh, examples. So in the end, we came up with this model, the Graph Convolutional Policy Network, a GCPN model, that combines three ingredients. Um, it uses a graph representation, which I mentioned previously is a bit more robust than a text representation. Um, we use graph neural networks to capture a lot of the complex uh, structural information. And as a, as a consequence of using a, a graph representation and also generating the graph kind of step by step, um, we can actually check uh, certain validities, like for example, valency um, at each intermediate step. Whereas you can't do this with a text-based representation usually because typically a, a intermediate a text representation of a molecule uh, doesn't actually map to any uh, proper structure. Secondly, you know, we, we use reinforcement learning to be able to directly optimize for, for the properties and rewards that we're interested in. Um, a lot of these properties um, are pretty complex and, and, it's, and you know, some of the, the decision steps they have to make is, is non-differentiable. So we, so we have to use um, reinforcement learning. And then thirdly, uh, in order to ensure that the examples we generate are realistic, we apply adversarial training, which uh, like what I mentioned previously, kind of compares the examples that we generate with, uh, with examples that we have said to be real and, and kind of make that a bit more, make the generated um, examples a bit more similar to the realistic set. So this model, the GCPM model, um, treats the graph generation process um, as an iterative process, um, where at each particular time step, we have a intermediate graph that we've completed so far, as well as a series of dummy nodes. And in, in this case, uh, each node represents the possible atom types that we can have. Then we apply our graph neural network uh, and perform message passing on our intermediate graph, as well as the, uh, the dummy nodes to obtain these updated node embeddings and then from these node embeddings, we sample a few things. We sample the identities of two nodes, so two atoms, as well as a particular edge type. So a particular a bond type that we want to create between these two sampled atoms. Then our, chemis our chemistry aware environment um, determines whether this action that our model proposed is, is, is uh, legit or not. Um, so for example, if it proposes uh, something that, that respects, uh, for example, chemical valency. So if it's valid, then the environment applies this action and then we get the next um, intermediate graph for the next step. And then we have a small positive uh, reward for the step. If, however, our model proposes an action that um, is chemically invalid, for example, it, it proposes to add a fifth bond to a carbon, then our environment says, uh, we're not gonna do this action. Uh, and then we're gonna, still have the same intermediate graph, but instead we'll have a very negative intermediate reward. And this is like a penalty to ensure that the model doesn't make these kind of mistakes in the future. Um, if at any time the model, if we sample the stop action, then we, we stop the process and then, then the final graph is, is a graph that we, that we have. And then from the final graph, we calculate certain uh, molecular properties that we wanted to optimize for as well as certain other kind of constraints that we had, for example, steric strain, as well as some 
uh, rules to get rid of um, certain uh, functional groups that are not desirable in drugs. And so overall, uh, the, the, the training procedure is we have our GCPN model in red that iteratively generates molecule graphs and then obtains a set of rewards. Um, we also have a green discriminator here uh, that compares our generated molecule with a set of realistic molecules. And based on how similar it is, we have this adversarial loss component. And then through reinforcement learning, here we use a policy gradient approach. We can directly modify our uh, GCPN generator model such that in the future, it's more likely to generate molecule graphs that are, you know, that have high property scores that are valid and that are, are realistic. So we, we tried our model on, on three different tasks. Uh, the first task is property optimization, which is, you know, just generating molecules that have a high uh, property score that we're interested in. The second one is property targeting, where we want to generate molecules where the where the property score is within a certain range that we've specified. Um, and we think this is useful for generating uh, maybe new libraries of, of, of molecules. And then thirdly, we have a constrained property optimization where instead of generating a molecule graph from scratch, um, we start from an existing molecule and then we make some changes to it to improve one of the, one of the scores. And so just quickly some, some information about the data that we used and baselines. Um, so for the set of realistic molecules that we compare with, we, had, we sampled 250,000 uh, molecules from zinc, and these are all molecules that you can actually uh, buy. Um, and also for the baselines, we compare with one of them is organ, which you know, is a model that also includes reinforcement learning and an adversarial loss component, but uses a text represent representation instead of a graph representation. And also a junction tree variation autoencoder, which at the time was the state of the art um, molecule generation method um, uh, that kind of encodes a molecule graph into a graph embedding and then uses Bayesian optimization to search for good embeddings and then you decode it. So the first uh, set of experiments in property optimization. Um, so we're here, we're looking at two very simple properties that we can calculate. One is penalized log P, which measures the hydrophobicity of the molecule, and QED, which, which is some metric for how drug-like the molecule is. And here we're reporting the top three high-scoring molecules that we generate, as well as what percentage of the molecules that we generate are, are valid. And you can see for, for all of these uh, properties, you know, our GCPM model generates the, the molecules of the highest scores. And here are some specific examples um, of the molecules we generate. And on the left is, the, is when we optimize for log P, on the right is when we optimize for QED. And um, you know, if we look at the left first, you know, your log P is actually a very trivial thing to optimize for. Um, you, know, you just kind of want to increase the, you know, the carbon chains, length of the carbon chains. Um, and I think, but I think what's more interesting is this, is this uh, special example here in purple, which has a very, very high log P score according to our property predictor. Um, and this is what happens when we turn off the adversarial loss component. So we don't, we remove the constraint that the molecule has to be realistic. And here, you know, it's commonly known that reinforcement learning methods to optimize rewards, they usually, uh, it's very easy for them to cheat these, these reward calculations. And here it turns out the log P calculator that we use uh, calculates log P based on a per atom contribution sum. And it turns out iodine has the highest per atom contribution. And so it created this chain of iodines. Which is why you know it's important to have some kind of constraint on on the kinds of molecule you want to generate. On the right, we have QED. Um, these are all very high scoring molecules. I think from Kemp's point of view, you know some of these molecules aren't super super. Uh, I would say good, but I would say that's probably a direct consequence of this particular property that we're trying to optimize for, um, as opposed to the the, the the particular model that we that we design. Um, and the reason why I picked these two properties is, you know, at the time, these were the properties that, uh, that were the typical benchmark properties that people used um, in this molecule generation field. So the second task is uh, property targeting. Here, we're looking at log P and molecular weight. So molecular weight kind of measures uh, indirectly the size of the molecule. And for each of them, we have two different kind of uh, uh, ranges of properties. And here you can, we can see that our GCPM model um, for all these properties has a high success rate as in it generates a high proportion of molecules that actually have these specified properties. 
Um, although, you know, some of the other baselines uh, for some of these uh, ranges have, have better diversity metrics. So they gen generate a wider range of molecules. And then lastly, we have the uh, constrained property optimization. Um, here, we are comparing our GCPN model of the junction tree VAE. Um, and here we can see that uh, from a, for different, ra different ranges of, of a similarity threshold, and this, this is like how similar our resulting molecule is to the starting molecule, we can see that our GCPN model can make edits that improve the scores the most. Um, and also has a high success rate. So, you know, it, the edits that it proposes tend to um, actually improve the score. So here's an example. We have our starting structures that are very hydrophilic, and then we want to make edits to it to make it more hydrophobic um, by improving the, uh, in, by increasing the log P score. So in conclusion, uh, this work kind of showed that um, through a sequential graph generation process, you can actually generate pretty complex graphs. And in particular, the, the, the GC mo GCPN model that we proposed um, uh, is able to generate molecule graphs with, with properties that we want um, and that are also uh, valid and realistic. So thirdly, and, and the last piece of work that I want to talk about is our, is our work on uh, synthesis planning. And, and this was actually one of the earlier works that I did uh, during my PhD. And this was done in collaboration with Baraf and Prasad, who, who were um, PhD and a master's student in computer science, as well as uh, Jade, Joe, Kwong, Stephen, and Jack, who are students in the chemistry department, as well as professors uh, Paul Wender and Vijay Pandey. And so the synthesis, synthesis planning problem is um, given a target molecule, can we predict a series of chemical transformations that uh, eventually lead up to commercially, start, uh, commercially available starting materials, such that you can buy these starting materials and then follow the reaction transformation steps to get the molecule that you want. And, and, and the motivation for us, at least, um, is that in typical computational drug discovery pipelines, I think perhaps um, people don't really, haven't really thought uh, a lot about um, this, uh, the, 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 the synthetic aspect of things. So for example, in the previous work, you know, all the molecule generation work, um, you know, we kind of assumed that the molecules that we had that were valid could be made, um, you know, in the lab and, and then for, for testing, which, which, which isn't actually the case. Um, you know, I think as a, you know, maybe as a computer scientist and as a, uh, a computational chemist, it's easy to fall into the trap that, you know, just because a molecule structure can be drawn um, and, and is chemically correct, um, you know, implies that it's synthetically feasible as in it can be made easily, which, which isn't the case. I um, mean, you know, this is a molecule, I think it's called mitotoxin. Um, you know, this is chemically correct, you know, all, all the valencies are, are fine, but you know, it's probably taking more than a decade and a half to, to with various attempts to try and make it. Um, so, th so this is, this is important in, in the drug discovery kind of pipeline because um, in these drug discovery projects, you know, you want to be able to at least make these molecules in a reasonable amount of time to, to test them. Um, you shouldn't propose stuff that um, takes a very long time to make. Um, and, and also you kind of, you know, just in general computational synthesis, synthesis planning, uh, you know, could be a very useful tool for medicinal chemistry. So, so there's, there's been quite a large body of work on computational synthetic planning, and, and this dates back all the way to the 60s, I think. Um, and, and a lot of these methods kind of fell into two camps. Um, the first type of method uh, is an expert system-based approach, where you apply chemical transformation rules um, to your molecule structures. And these rules are typically encoded um, or, or designed by, by expert chemists. And, and one issue here is that these expert rule-based uh, systems um, uh, usually don't generalize well. So, so, there's, so they have problems making predictions on, on for example, molecules that, that, that you haven't really seen before. On the other hand, you have the physical chemistry based approach, which, which, which uses physics and, and like low level theory to kind of predict the energy barriers of a reaction. So how, how likely you know, two reactants can actually react. Um, you know, these kind of approaches are very generalizable because you're, you're using physics, um, but they're very computationally expensive. Uh, and, and almost too expensive for, for the usual systems that, that you're interested in, in drug discovery. And I would say, you know, both of these kinds of approaches have, have not really had a 
huge practical impact on, on practicing organic chemists um, due to these various uh, drawbacks. I think in the past few years, uh, we've, we started to see some very, very interesting work trying to, trying to tackle this problem. Uh, you know, where people have used you know, machine learning, which ideally you know, is more generalizable than a rule-based system, but is much more computationally uh, cheaper in a physical chemistry model. And so, so the machine learning kind of approach is, is the one that I'm gonna focus on in this talk. Uh, but, but firstly, you know, you can actually uh, break down, you know, the synthesis plane problem into two uh, distinct sub problems. Uh, the first one is a single step reaction prediction task where you want to predict, uh, you know, you kind of want to map the reactants to a product or map a product to, to a set of reactants. Um, and, and the second problem is, is, is the kind of the analysis part where you want to kind of string together multiple of these single step predictions as such that you can recursively transform a target molecule into uh, commercially available precursor molecules. Um, this work, I'm going to uh, focus on the, the single step uh, reaction prediction problem. So at the time, this was uh, early 2017, um, there was some very uh, exciting work in this area of, of a single step reaction prediction um, uh, problem. Um, and they kind of also fell into two different types of approaches. Uh, the first approach uh, kind of combined a typical rule-based express system with a, a neural network uh, module on top. And, and the neural network would uh, kind of either rank the, applicab uh, the applicability of each rule in, in your knowledge base, or would rank you know, how likely each of the predicted products are. Um, and you know, this was done in both the forward and the reverse direction. Um, there was also this like another interesting approach where you know, instead of having you know, uh, two modules in a system, you, you, have a, you have a single model that could directly map a, uh, your reactants to the products uh, and or vice versa. Um, one of them was a sequence to sequence based approach um, that predicted uh, you know, the products from a, from a series of reactants. Um, you know, our work kind of uh, you know, built on this work on a direct mapping approach. Um, instead, we focus on the retrosynthetic direction. Um, and, and you know, there are some unique challenges, I would say, uh, in the retrosynthetic direction. You know, at least in the forward prediction direction, you know, your starting materials kind of constrain the possible you know, reaction types or the possible products that you can obtain from the reaction. Whereas in the retrosynthetic direction, uh, given a target molecule, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's typically a lot of different ways you can actually perform the disconnection. And, uh, and there's like different uh, chemical reactions that could, that could end up in your target target molecule. And so there's a lot more possibilities. And, and so your deep learning model kind of has to generate a, a lot of these potential possibilities. Now, you know, I, I mentioned in the previous work that, uh, you know, you can represent molecules as text sequences. And I also said why it's not the, not the best to represent molecules as text sequences. But, you know, in 2017, there, there wasn't any work on, on graph generation with deep learning models. And so, you know, we also uh, represented, um, and it was common to represent molecules as text sequences for these kind of uh, problems. Um, but, you know, if you were to look at, you know, a reaction, single step reaction prediction problem where you map, you know, uh, for example, reactants to products or products to reactants, um, you're essentially having an input sequence mapping to an output sequence. And, and there's a lot of analogies between this kind of mapping and, and machine translation, right? Where you want to map a input sequence in one language to an output sequence in another, another language. And so we, you know, we also applied a sequence to sequence model, which is a model that's used a lot in machine translation, which basically kind of summarizes the input sequence character by character in this case, and then outputs the output sequence character by character based on uh, the, the input summary. And so here we are given a target molecule represented by as a text sequence, we're predicting another text sequence that represents the predicted products. I think the one thing that we found was, was important was uh, beam search decoding was important. Um, so here, in, you know, instead of when we're, de when we're decoding and generating the output sequence character by character, we keep like the top K candidate sequences, um, such that in the end we have usually K, uh, uh, K predictions. Um, and you know, this is important for the retrosynthetic direction because there's so many possibilities that we need to account for. And so just a, you know, another snippet, brief snippet of our results. Uh, so we compared our sequence to sequence translation model with a simple rule-based baseline. And we show across the various, uh, you know, top N candidates that we have uh, comparable uh, accuracies. Um, 
But I think what's, what's interesting is you have these other kinds of uh, implicit advantages of using these direct mapping, uh, for example, sequence to sequence translation approach. One is, you know, this is trained end to end, right? You just need to have your input examples and like, for example, you just need your products and your reactants and your model can just directly train using that data set. Whereas the other approach where you apply a rule-based approach with a neural network, um, you know, there's two modules and, and the rule-based approach, typically you need, you know, reaction rules to be generated automatically and that requires atom mapping, which, you know, at the time, you know, wasn't very a trivial, uh, you know, wasn't a trivial kind of problem. Um, in some ways, you know, I think, you know, the sequence-based sequence approach scales a bit more effectively um, to larger training set when you're making predictions uh, because it's largely independent of how big your training set is, where as for a lot of these rule-based systems, it kind of depends on how many rules you have in your knowledge base that you have to compare with, and that depends on how big your training set is. And, la and, and lastly, you know, our sequence-to-sequence -sequence model kind of naturally incorporates the whole molecule structure, whereas uh, reaction rules typically, you know, the transformations are encoded by like uh, uh, the local environments around the reaction centers. So you, in some ways you can, you can lose out on a lot of uh, molecular information. Um, so overall, you know, this, this particular work, we showed a machine translation model can be used for the retrosynthetic single step reaction prediction. And, and I think this direct mapping approach where you, you know, directly convert re uh, reactions to products or products to reactants is, is very interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, subsequent work, um, uh, you know, exploring different uh, uh, RNN architectures for the, for the translation model uh, from the folks at, um, at IBM. And that's very, very exciting. Um, there's also some more recent work on, you know, using graph representations and using, you know, a direct graph translation for this kind of uh, method, which I think is also quite exciting. Um, and also other people have, have looked at and instead of a single step reaction prediction, they focused on, 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 the, on, the, on the analysis part and how to use different uh, search algorithms to be able to do the multi-step synthesis. And I think that, uh, that is very, very promising. So uh, overall, in conclusion, um, this, this talk, I've mainly focused on our work on uh, lead optimization, small molecule lead optimization, which is an important part of drug discovery where given a lead molecule, we're gonna kind of develop it further, make changes to it into a viable drug candidate. Um, and I've talked about some of our, easy, uh, our early work on, on the, the design process of this uh, lead optimization cycle uh, in molecule property prediction, molecule generation, and some synthesis planning. And you know, a lot of the, these kind of sub problems that you, you can kind of uh, break out, um, these are actually you know, very interrelated with each other, right? Like, you know, building good molecular property predictors can be used in the molecule generation algorithm to, to optimize for, to generate molecules that have optimized properties. And, you know, incorporating uh, the synthesis aspect of things, you know, also helps you design molecules quicker. And hopefully, uh, you know, the ultimate aim was to show that, you know, machine learning can, can be used for these sub problems and, and potentially speed up and, and improve this overall kind of lead to optimization process. So, so some uh, acknowledgements. Um, obviously, you know, I'd like to thank uh, my advisors, uh, Vijay Pandey and Yuri Leskovic. Um, it's been uh, very, very great working with them and having the opportunity to work with them. Um, I, I thank them a lot for, for their guidance uh, and, and their support. And I think you know, they, they gave me a lot of freedom during my PhD to kind of explore problems that I was personally interested in. And, and, and I'm very grateful for, for, for that. Um, I'd like to also thank my other committee members, uh, Carla, Peter, and Paul, uh, for, for, for their advice and support. Um, and Vijay mentioned previously that, you know, I've also collaborated with, with uh, all my committee members. And I think these collaborations have been very, very uh, fulfilling. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, members of the of the SNAP research group and, and the and the Pande group. Um, you know, this is a photo of, of, of one of the Christmas parties that we had um, in the SNAP group. And you know, also, you know, we, we had these uh, Tahoe ski trips, which, which were very fun. But you know, a very great bunch of people to work with. I learned a lot, especially the computer science uh, part of things. Um, and also, you know, from the Pande group, you know, great bunch of people to work with, you know, we're all 
uh, even though you know I'm, I'm probably the, the last uh, maybe student who graduated from the group, you know, but it was it was a very very great to have, to have had the chance to work with all of you. And as a Pana group member, I think I'm obliged to show case some of our formal photos. Uh, so here are some of our uh, lab Halloween photos, 2015, uh, 2016, and uh, 2017. So yeah, we, we take Halloween uh, pretty seriously. Um, you know, I also like to thank all my collaborators that I had the chance to work with during my time at Stanford. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the, the other works that I, the other collaborative works I worked on, I, I didn't get the chance to, to speak about in, in this talk. Um, but, you know, these collaborations have been very enriching. And it was fantastic to be able to work with uh, such fine collaborators. I also like to thank the, the student service manager, Roger, uh, for, for helping me uh, navigate uh, a, lot of, a lot of the system, as well as uh, the admin staff, uh, Teresa, Yesenia, Virginia, Lenny, and Cynthia. Um, I also like to thank my undergrad advisors, uh, uh, Professor Penny Brothers, David Ware, and, uh, and Jen Yong, uh, for uh, their support when I was doing my undergrad and for, for you know, inspiring me to pursue research uh, uh, in grad school. And also, you know, Penny and David also got their PhD, chemistry PhDs from Stanford uh, a while back. Um, and they also suggested that I should uh, uh, consider Stanford, um, which, which worked out very well. Um, I also like to thank my high school teachers, uh, Mr. Bergen, Ms. Tanner, Mr. Kendon, um, uh, who got me inspired uh, and, and kind of got me very interested in chemistry and kind of uh, directed me uh, almost uh, towards this current track that I'm on. Uh, I'd like to also thank all, all my friends uh, you know, back in New Zealand, as well as all the friends that I made here at Stanford. Uh, you know, all, all the, you know, the coffees that we had, the brunches, the, the walks around um, campus, some, some late night burger runs, um, and, and a few EDM concerts, uh, gaming sessions, you know, these, uh, you know, you, you know who you are, um, you know, these, I'm very deep, deeply grateful for, the, for this companionship, uh, and it's really made my time at Stanford uh, that much better. Uh, I'd also like to thank my girlfriend, Hannah, for her love and support. Uh, I think, you know, knowing you has definitely been one of my highlights uh, here at Stanford. Um, so, yeah. and, and lastly, I, I'd like to also thank uh, my family, uh, my mom and dad, my, my grandparents, um, my aunts, uncles, uh, my cousins, uh, for their love and support. Um, you know, they've been a very, I would say, stabilizing influence uh, in my time at Stanford. Uh, you know, during the times where maybe I didn't really believe in myself, uh, you know, they, they always believed in me. And, um, you know, during the times when maybe I was overconfident, they you know, rapidly cut me down. Um, but, uh, yeah, I love you all. So, uh, thank you. Uh, that's it. And I'm open to any questions. Should I stop? Should I stop sharing? Sure.